Hello everyone. I hope you're uncommonly well today and welcome to Homemakers Radio. If you're not feeling well and you just want to sit still for a while, this is a good thing to listen to. You don't have to watch anything. I'm not going to perform anything miraculous today. And today, also, if you are new here, please go to the link in the description box below on the channel and click that and go to the post where I've embedded this video so that you can see more pictures and a perhaps a summary of what I have spoken of and maybe I will requote some things and post other information. Before you go, I would just like to remind you to get dressed and if unless of course you're just sitting this out and also I would like to share my cup of tea uh, or my teacup with you. I have shown this to you before. It kind of matches that picture behind me but it's uh, instead of roses it's a sweet pea and the bottom of it says it's Clarence China and it says 52 on it which might mean 1952 a lot of these were uh, just gift cups without they weren't a series and they didn't have a name there was no name on this although online it says sweet pea but I think I got it at an antiques store in the, in a shop in the high desert so I'm very proud of this and I, you've seen it before I'm recycling everything now before I go on to my lesson today, I want to show you my hairstyle and I'm using a mirror here to make sure that I I show the side of it there. I just wanted to show you I'm come in from a Jane Austen walk and I'm attempting some Jane Austen hairstyles and I wanted to tell you how I did this. If I can find it, it's no big deal. I just have one of these clips. I started using these in the 1980s to get away from those metal clips that you pinched both sides of because they break the hair. So I had done several experiments with putting ribbons on them and different things to be able to use this and have figured out how to divide my hair and then take another piece up and put that with it and then use a clip and then put more hair over it. So everybody has to find their own way. I don't have uh, instructions for this style, but I do watch a lot of uh, messy updo um, videos on YouTube and other places. And so everybody has to find their own thing. And so I want to remind you that not everything I say is suitable for you and I am just sharing my experience and my opinion. I don't expect anyone will follow it exactly because you have your family, you have your house, you have your the way that you earn a living and the way that you have to live is totally different than anybody else. And so you just have to use some of, some of this for entertainment and not to, not follow anyone. We all have our friends and we don't do the same thing our friends do. Uh, my friends have uh, have one friend who has a 1950s style house and so that's how she likes to decorate it and she's interested in that and but I don't do mine that way and so we but we still we can still be friends. That's one of our ba basic uh, jokes. <laughs> so today I want to also share with you something about how I store my teacups because someone on uh, a comment mentioned that. Okay, I take the heaviest one like this and I'll put a lightweight one on top like this and put that in the cabinet. Uh, it seems to be better than storing them on their sides or stacking them inside of each other. They just seem to it just seems to preserve them much better and sometimes I can get a third one up there if it is very lightweight and then of course that requires that people be careful when they're getting them out of the cabinet and when the descendants are here they open up the china cabinet and just get what they want out of there I don't wait on them and I don't set out a, a big tea thing I just let them get their own things so now we're going to the paper bag challenge that I mentioned of uh, my descendants and I have of uh, different things you can do with paper, brown paper or paper bags. And I do have some things that are just more crafty, creative, and fun. But because I'm trying to keep up with this, I do the simplest, quickest that I can. So I took, you know, I told you we've got these brown paper bags here for our groceries and some of them are quite quite stiff. You, you can't really crinkle them. They're so 
they're so well made and then they have this handle on it which I, I just think that's the neatest thing this handle it's like we have to pay five cents for these but see how big they are and, and all my groceries can go in this well I cut it here usually there's a there's a folding line there so I cut a piece off and this is what I made with it and I I cut that there and glued this at the bottom and just put clothes pegs on it to hold it down till it dried and then it still has quite a bit of room in there so I will use this when I have a day uh, maybe what you would call an, uh, a Regency day or Austin day or a, or a Victorian day and what uh, the children and I will go outside and these will be our nature bags and we will put a bird feather a pine cone a heart-shaped stone or rock and other things maybe leaves and things that we like and bring them in and uh, to make a little display in a bowl and so this is my nature bag and I have seen these these nature bags at uh, Victorian Trading Company has one made out of lace or vinyl lace vinyl and lace and they want you know 65 to 75 dollars for it whereas we've got these but these can be used for other things too for example I have an, a massive amount of uh, clipped recipes from the back of uh, flower bags and and just things I have jotted down very quickly myself and pieces of paper and they would fit really nice in one of these so I would put I see I've got some kind of a nature thing here it's a wreath and uh, cut it out of a magazine or something but I would put maybe a picture of uh, food on it and then put all my pieces of pieces of uh, paper with the recipes hurriedly scribbled on just temporary as you can see I'm not real uh, organized here I have to make this this isn't going to last forever but you know you can decoupage over all of it and make it a little bit more sturdy right here at the top and all you would have to do is take a paintbrush and some glue like school glue and paint over it and give it a little bit more of a lacquer and uh, I mentioned that I had glued the the edges together here after I cut it well I've got this glue and Mr. S bought it for me when I was in captivity right now he's in captivity because he wants to get some things done and I'm the one having to go out but he got me this glue and it's called crazy art and uh, I was impressed because it has this little flat piece on it and what you do is you put your glue down and you can um, you can press it out at the same time smear it out and and move it around with this little flat piece wasn't that clever I just have to tell you it's called uh, washable school glue and normally I would avoid uh, some of these cheaper brands because they often didn't work but this was pretty good so now we've done that and now I'm going to read you your scripture and make sure that if you're feeling well and you have uh, gotten ready and you're dressed I, I want to emphasize more why that is important because it gives you a sense of dignity and humanness you know animals don't get up and get dressed they wear the same thing every day <laughs> we're just we're above that and uh, we have a problem here in the year 2021 which is astonishing is that uh, people have forgotten about uh, cleanliness and dressing up and well I don't know maybe not where you live but I've noticed it more of a decline in that uh, feeling of wanting to be dignified and to to be uh, bathed and dressed and even even elderly people have to be careful because uh, if you want to be relevant if you want to be able to be to feel like you are accepted and that you're listened to and that that you're just part of humanity you're going to have to be careful with your appearance it becomes even more more important because as you age you tend to look uh, defeated um, bowed over brittle dried out um, like you're failing and even dying and we want to live while we are alive and not a, we want to we want to celebrate life not death right now and so as you get older you want those later years to be more vital and more productive 
you, you know, naturally when you're young, it'll be that way. You don't have that much to worry about. But as you get older, I think it's really important because people will view you as though you don't matter because you're not in the middle uh, age group that is still trying to find their way in life and still busy accomplishing things and they might look at you as less. And yes, we do care somewhat what people think, in some ways not, but uh, you know, even the Bible talks about how we have to be careful what a stranger would think or what an, what impression we're giving to an outsider that we don't uh, lead them astray and uh, give them false impressions. That's not good. I want to read one verse to you and then I'm going to go on with our continue with Jane Austen Eats Bread. <laughs> so, and I might share a little bit of how I make bread, but actually I don't have a recipe and I kind of throw things in there and I kind of feel the recipe and if it looks like it's uh, too soft or too uh, too grainy or something, I, I will alter it. And I was reading Linda Lichter's book called uh, The Benevolence of Manners, used to be Simple Social Graces. And she mentioned the way the Victorians created their food and cooked was they didn't follow a recipe. They felt it, they looked at it, they saw it, they smelled it, they they sensed it. Uh, in many ways and they sampled it until they got it right and so this is how I this is how I bake bread but I will give you a a recipe it depends on your with bread it depends on the flour you use and the temperature of your kitchen in general and whether the flour is you know cold remember we used to put it in the freezer or refrigerator or something for some reason I don't remember back in the 80s people were putting it storing it in the refrigerator and it might have been just to keep uh, pests away from it and uh, so they were t she was talking about in this book simple social graces that they felt instead of following these recipes they felt it and the recipes were passed down from uh, generation to generation and of course it all depends on the different kinds of ingredients you're using. It depends on what the weather is outside. Did you know that if you have a lot of humidity, it's going to have an impression on your bread baking? If you're using yeast breads, there are other kinds. So now I want to talk about this verse, and it is Colossians 3, and the verse is 15. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Now that is really interesting because of that word rule. I was going to look it up in all the different languages and try to try to uh, impress you with it as the word rule. When you have rule over something, you have control. Um, so if you let the peace of God control your hearts, it's very hard, isn't it? With all the, you're going to have to eliminate a lot of the things that that crowd it out. And uh, I was talking to one of my children lately, and he said that he had experimented and taken two weeks and not even listened to any kind of media. And he said he was just like floating in bliss. <laughs> and then when he finally uh, accidentally heard something, he felt his jaw uh, stiffen. And then when he deliberately decided to test it again and, and deliberately listen to something, he felt other types of uh, strange things going on that were very debilitating to his feeling of well-being. And uh, so if you're going to let the peace of God rule in your hearts, and to meditate on a scripture like that, uh, we were taught you would say, let the peace of God rule in your hearts. And then you would change the emphasis so that you could sift all the wonderful meanings out of it. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. And then you would look up the word peace and you would study the different aspects of it and the meaning of it and the root meanings and uh, the ancient meanings. And then of God, of God, like there's all kinds of peace, isn't there? There's the peace that the government claims they're going to give you. There's the peace that the pharmaceuticals claim they're going to give you peace of mind. And there's the peace of uh, health practitioners that uh, claim to take away uh, some of your problems. And there's there's the peace of the media that uh, they're going to say, you know, you need to do this in order to get peace in your life. But the peace of God. So then we would look that up and figure out what is the peace of God? And then, then we would look up the word rule. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. 
And that word rule had something to do with uh, different things like that you wouldn't have thought. It'd be uh, military, and it would be um, it would be like the ruler of a country and uh, the ruler of of the skies and the ruler uh, the rule of God, and then um, rule in your hearts. And uh, so we would have to sift that all out in our homeschool lesson and really study that. And then, besides the knowledge of it, we really tried to live it. Let's see how we can live it. Let's see how we can enact it. So there's the theory, and then there's the practice. So theory was studying the meaning, and practice was let's see how we can do it as situations come up. That is very hard. But I'd like to sometime invite you for a two-hour natural kind of uh, day where we would do things deliberately that brought peace to you. And uh, it's it's like going to some of these uh, seminars where you'd go for, stay in a really nice Victorian house and they would take you through different things to do for just for a weekend. I'd like to do that for two hours sometime. Now I'd like to also read to you a book called uh, from a book called The Jane Austen Diet by Brian Kozlowski. I have his permission to read this, although I am stuttering through most of it. I don't have time often to read ahead and reread it so that I don't, but we've been reading the chapter on Jane Austen Eats Bread, and what I like about Brian Kozlowski is that he dug a little deeper into these novels, and I believe that she had seven of them, and he pulled out things that we just didn't notice, and even the movies of the 1990s that did Pride and Prejudice and Emma and Sense and Sensibility and uh, Persuasion, they did a very good job of it, but they were so subtle, the things were so subtle that I didn't quite catch it till I read his book. For example, when we read the chapter on Jane Austen, Walk Like an, uh, walk like an Austen, uh, how they went for walks, and uh, they weren't doing it in a fashion that was just to check it off the list, but they were observing everything around them and uh, breathing and smiling and uh, just getting kind of a boost from the nature around them and from the walk itself and from the air. Well, I rewatched some of these movies and I saw how how brilliantly they did it, especially the Pride and the uh, was it the A and E Pride and Pride and Prejudice or was it the BBC Pride and Prejudice, and uh, the, one of the opening scenes, I believe the opening scene was Elizabeth uh, out in the walking a path and and even running and uh, and how brilliantly they did this with the expression on her face and how she was uh, being so exhilarated by it all. So if you had a two-hour uh, Jane Austen um, session with me, that's what we would do. So now I've been reading about the bread, and um, I discussed the bread afterwards with my daughter, and she was sending me pictures with a, a ruler showing how how skinny she got to cut her bread. And he talked about how the bread was so thin that it was like a petal. In one of her books, she said it was like a, the petal of a, I don't know if it was a poppy or a rose, rose or what, but it was so thin. Well, naturally, they could eat bread because it was so thin. And I think that uh, one of the things that makes it easy to slice is if it has the the gluten in the flour. Our flour apparently doesn't contain the same amount of gluten that it had in it that would have glued it together. You can think of the word glue when you think of gluten. But the bread was so thin, uh, I don't think it would make anybody fat. And what we've suffered for for years is this thicker bread that we've had sandwiches with and and uh, now, of course, with everyone trying to keep from getting too fat, they have eliminated a lot of it. But I did make some that did slice fairly well. And uh, I think I, one of my grandsons got into bread making, and he was able to slice it so thin it was like a, a potato chip, just that thin. But if you can imagine having uh, tea sandwiches with that, that would be absolutely, you could eat without guilt. 
So, so, uh, he, the last thing that I read last time was that bread was truly one of the greatest less is more foods on Regency tables. So I'm going to just repeat this so that we can connect from the last session that I had here with you. To tear off bigger chunks from the loaf would have bordered too much on inelegance. However, I do understand that um, laborers and peasants and, and travelers did carry big chunks of bread with them for, for their sustenance. Fact is, the Regency poor had no choice but to live on bread alone in order to survive. Richer folk and those who strived to live like them could afford to eat it in refined moderation. Hence, Miss Bates' indirect boast on how small her regular order is in the baker's, at the baker's in Emma. For what is our consumption of bread? You know, only three of us. Her rhetorical point was, it's very little. Daily enjoyed yet daintily eaten is the bread balance every conscientious she answers, every conscientious Austinite aims for. And since I read that last time, I have been really happily enjoying a very thin slice of bread. Now I've got mine down to one sixteenth of an inch, and I'll lay it on the plate and put it in the toaster oven for a few minutes and put some butter on it. See, the thinner your bread, the less uh, butter, jam, honey, whatever you put on it, that you'll need. So I've been really, really enjoying that since I have read this, and uh, I think that happiness is all part of health, and if you could be happy with the food that you eat, are you really happy with the food you eat? Do you, do you enjoy the taste of it? Are you enjoying it, or are you just trying to get something out of it that, that you can't? So some of these things that he's written about with her food, with their food, is... Uh, is helping a lot to understand food and to enjoy it. And I think also if you have little children, they should enjoy their food too. It should be something that they're eager uh, to get up in their chairs and eat, that they really enjoy. Okay, the usual practice of elegant females. I may have read this to you. It's still considered posh and elegantly upper class to eat bread with dainty restraint in modern day England. There, the proper way of tackling anything bready served with a spread, be it toast with jam or rolls with butter, involves first breaking off a small, mouth sized bite of bread with your fingers and spreading butter and jam just on that tiny bit. Yes, uh, when I had a tea room here, the jam and butter was put on the plate with the scone or sliced bread and they were to take their little knife and break off a piece of the roll or the bread and butter that. That's what you did. Then you pop it in your mouth. It made more sense. Um, only after you've eaten that piece can you repeat the process. Now we could probably find a video on this and if I can I will post it with this. Those of you who are new here, please click the link in the description and go to the post where this is to see other videos. Sometimes I put a song on there. Sometimes I'll find something about tea drinking and post that also. Other videos on it along with this one. Starting over with another mouth sized bite to break off, spread, and eat. It all makes for a purposefully slow and mindful way of eating bread that seriously limits the likelihood of overeating it. You know, I'll never forget, it, it makes me laugh now, but I was so embarrassed. We were on uh, the Oriana, 1967, and we were on a, going to Australia. We were immigrating. We were a big family, and we were part of a program that the Australian government had pro provided. And uh, Harold Holt was the prime minister, and he disappeared on while we were on the ship. <laughs> we were in Hawaii when the news came out. And uh, but anyway, <laughs> I digress. The we stopped. We always had tea on this ship. It was a British ship, and we would all go and so being Americans we had no clue uh, because on the homestead we had big thick pieces of bread that our mother had made and we we slathered it with butter and jam or peanut butter and, and just chomped 
on the piece. And then we were noticing around us very uneasily that the British people that were there and the Australians were doing it properly, taking a piece off and then buttering it and, and putting that in their mouth and not even uh, attempting to tear off another piece until they had finished eating that one piece. Which to me made more sense because you wouldn't uh, you wouldn't get a stomach ache, you wouldn't eat too fast, and you also wouldn't look ridiculous like we did. <laughs> the vulgar alternative, however, is to slather all the butter jam over the bread in one go, then chomp your way through the whole slice, no doubt finishing off the slice and reaching for another before realizing you've even begun. Eek! <laughs> I wish I'd go back and do it right. <laughs> Jane knew that most of us experienced a natural craving for a bit of bread, not an entire bakery full. Now one of the reasons that we eat so much is that the bakery breads, uh, the commercial breads made from the commercial flours and ingredients, don't give us a feeling of well-being or satisfaction after you eat it. Uh, they don't make you happy. If you came here for tea, you could eat one bite of my bread and you would be happy. <laughs> now, of course, I am making these videos for my descendants, for my children and grandchildren, and I've decided to go ahead and go public and share it all with you. So, uh, this is a message to them as well, in case they um, throw me over for something more elegant. Uh, at least I will have made a splash in the in the public sphere. To use her expression, one can feel perfectly satisfied over even small servings of bread. Oh, doesn't that sound nice? Goodness, that's what I want. I want to feel perfectly satisfied over even small servings of bread. Now, one thing we can do to keep from gaining weight and uh, having stomach aches or eating too fast or just feeling frustrated over food, the food problem, is to go ahead and have a, a small piece of bread, a little quarter piece of homemade bread with something on it. Sit down properly, put a placemat there if you have to make to make it feel like it's it's uh, official. Uh, sit down, have a cup of tea with it, and eat it. And don't eat on foot. If you live alone, this is a terrible problem. I know what it's like because Mr. S used to be gone a lot, and still is, and it's really bad. I, you know, stand in front of the fridge and drink something out of a carton or stand over the sink and eat a sandwich very quickly, and that's not good. There's something, uh, God intended, I believe, something very emotional to go on with food when you're eating, and you can go through the, you know, we go through the Bible, and of course we're concerned about uh, our eternal destiny, and that's one reason that we read it, and we have faith in it, but we miss some things about living today in it and you go through and you look just like I said if you look up uh, enterprise earning a living money it's all in there but we just don't see it it's it's like this guy he has pulled out of Jane Austen's book things that we don't see because we're looking at a bigger a subject but it's like with food in the Bible it starts out with food doesn't it and uh, then as you go through, you see how important food was in certain incidents. Look at Joseph. What was he doing? He uh, saved uh, people's lives through food storage. And then all through, all through, you see uh, it'd be an interesting thing to go through and pick up anything to do with food. As a matter of when the Israelites were crossing the Red Sea, food was uh, emphasized because they had to have this unleavened bread because if they had bread with leavening or yeast in it, it would rise uh, while they were crossing the Red Sea and they couldn't tend to it. So they had unleavened bread. And how much uh, food factors in? Clear from the, from the beginning to the, uh, to the Lord's Supper and on and uh, all the admonitions about eating and drinking. So I have uh, strayed again from my text. So... So, to use her expression, that's this is the one I like, one can feel perfectly satisfied over even a small servings of bread. Now, I've mentioned before, you need to have small increments of time and a list of things to do. Uh, go for a five-minute walk. Go for, uh, 
you know, five minute tea break, uh, five minute reading, uh, five minute sewing on a button or doing something uh, crafty, five minutes uh, in the kitchen, putting something uh, aright, you know, cleaning out a drawer, five minutes of texting a friend, five minutes of reading uh, some of your periodicals that have come in the mail and uh, five minutes just just give yourself a list of five minute things to do so this idea was validated by Paul Rosen a professor of psychology at the University of Pennsylvania who found that bread portion sizes can be easily manipulated without us ever feeling deprived in a real-world experiment in 2005 Rosen closely observed the eating habits of residents at one apartment building where three times a week a large supply of soft pretzels was put out in the lobby for the residents enjoyment. On normal days people reached for a whole pretzel that is until Rosen had the pretzels cut in half. Now totally free to take two halves people automatically cut back grabbing half a pretzel instead what they naturally viewed as a single serving. Yes, a single serving. Applying the same half rule to your bread choices will get you closer to a more Regency appropriate relationship with bread. Whether that's a half a bagel instead of a whole, a thin slice instead of a thick one, or three crackers instead of six. By the way, you can make your own crackers. Uh, there are plenty of recipes uh, online that you can find and I'd highly recommend it because you can avoid some of these uh, fake salts and sodiums and put your own sea salt in it and use your own good flour and it it's just absolutely so much better for you and save yourself the trouble of using antacids. Um, one serving instead of six bread is one of the few things Austin would totally recommend learning to love by halves. I've heard that expression before. Love something by halves? Hmm. I'll have to look that one up. I, I like uh, figures of speech, as you know. Doing full justice to bread. What type of bread did Austin eat? Better yet, what did she avoid? Because while Jane certainly enjoyed her regular bit of toast, bun, and buttered crumpet, not all bread was created equal in her mind. The Regency era was one of the first pioneers of adding what we would now call chemical additives to bread. A popular craze for whiter, cheaper loaves, sound familiar, prompted bakers to bulk up their bread with all manner of questionable and sometimes dangerous ingredients. Powdered chalk and alum were the usual adulterants, but lime, ground animal bones, and the occasional dose of white lead were also suspected of being surreptitiously slipped in as well. The bread I eat in London is a deleterious paste, complained the novelist Tobias Smollett in 1771, mixed up with chalk, alum, and bone ashes, insipid to the taste and destructive to the constitution. Well, you read the ingredients on the bag of bread that you're buying at the grocery store, and then you go look up all those ingredients and ask yourself if they are, if they are something that is necessary to your health and well-being. And uh, some of you who lived before bread was sold in the grocery stores uh, you, you could go to bakeries and get it um, but uh, sold in such huge amounts I mean I noticed at a grocery store the other day a big um, wheeled cart full of bread and of course it's got a long shelf life too and that means that it's got ingredients in it that is causing it keeping it from from spoiling whereas uh, in this book I read called Greater Health God's Way by Stormy Ormation she mentioned something about why we have to like foods that are fresh and if they spoil quickly that means they're uh, they're natural they're they're very fresh so you want that's why you want to eat them while they're fresh for, in, for instance you would try to eat an apple as fresh as possible as close to the tree as, it, as you can uh, and not let it sit there a long time because then it uh, the nutrients are not as as fresh the baker he added is obliged to poison us all 
Austin suspected the same. While visiting London, one was all too liable to eat very bad baker's bread, she told her sister in 1813. Oh dear, so they've always been doing that, right? Her suspicions could just as easily apply today. We might not find the odd pulverized bone listed on its labels, but the modern bread aisle is, in very real ways, an additive blast from the Regency past. Well, he was so clever. Questionable ingredients are now being added to bread with the same historic gusto, with some of the most questionable of all, including, uh-oh, here we go, uh, Okay, gluten. Now, I mentioned that flour, really good flour, has natural gluten in it. That's why you can slice the homemade bread so thin. Gluten. This is not the natural gluten, the organic protein found in wheats, oats, barley, and rye, and present in humanity's bread since the dawn of eating it. Rather, it means vital gluten has been added to the dough, a concentrated, highly processed form of powdered gluten chemically engineered for the mass bread market. Adding, you know, you can always trace something bad back to the love of money, can't you? And greed. <clears throat> Adding such artificially high levels of gluten allows bread companies to create light, springy loaves faster than ever before. It is also suspected of being one of the prime culprits of the modern rise in gluten sensitivity and celiac disease. You know, he's done his research because he's got a number here. It's number seven. It's probably from some, um, from some study that has been done. I didn't look up the the footnotes here. Now, when you're making bread, uh, I just make it maybe every other day and just make, I just make a little pan of two little loaves and, and I don't make a big deal out of it and I don't put them in loaf pans. I have not had good success with loaf pans because uh, the heat has to go through those pans and I don't know what's going on, but I like to, to roll them out. It looks like a a loaf of French bread from a French bakery and I like to see what's going on around the whole loaf. I look through the window of the oven and see. So you're supposed to let it rise several times and that takes time. That's slow. Well they couldn't do that if they wanted to make quick sales so they they don't let it rise. Potassium bromate. The flour that I buy is called King Arthur because it's there's no brom. It says never bromated. I'll have to show that to you next time. Now, what bromating is? I hope he explains it. Often lurking as bromated flour on ingredient labels, potassium bromate might help modern bread loaves rise and increase in volume. But when it is banned in most of Europe, Canada, and Japan for its link to causing uh, cancer in lab rats. She's also got a footnote here, which I don't know. I'd have to look it up in the back where he has it by chapter, the footnotes by chapter, and I want to continue reading. So if you want to know more about it, you can get Jane Austen Diet, the Jane Austen Diet book. Now, I didn't find this fascinating till I started to read it aloud, and then I caught some of the expressions and some of the uh, clever ways that he uses words, and it started to uh, come alive for me. I can see now why God wanted uh, preachers uh, to preach the Word of God because we can read it ourselves, but sometimes when you hear someone telling it, uh, reading it aloud, uh, meanings come out a little differently and, and more deeply. Okay, see if I can pronounce this. Butylated hydroxin assault, BHA, okay? My mother used to go on and on about BHA and BHT, which were in ingredients and many of the ingredients that she tried to buy to make her own bed, bread. Um, the jury is still out on the overall safety of BHA, a popular preservative used to increase the shelf life of bread, but the National Institutes of Health now concludes that it is reasonably anticipated to be a human carcinogen. Oh. I just ran across another carcinogen the other day. Um, obviously, very little has changed since Austin warned her sister about the likelihood of eating very bad bread. 
which is probably why she so eagerly reminds us of the simple solution. In Emma, there are repeated references to a bakery, a honest, a good, honest, wholesome bakery in the village of Highbury. This is where Miss Bates buys her dependable loaves and where dwaddling children tend to cluster around the baker's little bow window eyeing the gingerbread. Austin even gives us the name of the baker's wife, a notably rare moment of giving details below the hierarchy of the upper classes. And this is the quote. The extremely civil and obliging Mrs. Wallace, a woman who does full justice to her baked goods. What that meant for Austin, doing full justice to bread, is what it has always meant, abiding by a traditional way of baking bread that hasn't changed since Mrs. Wallace lit her bread ovens three centuries ago. That is, natural ingredients kneaded, leavened, and baked normally. Bread bakers in both the Regency era and today have never needed more than four basic ingredients, flour, yeast, water, and salt. Yep. See, because the taste is going to come from the things that you put on it. To create a delicious loaf, adding much more than that, seeing 15 or 20 or 30 ingredients on a bread label, and you're likely heading into bad bread territory no matter what, what the century. I think that if we quit eating the commercial bread right now, and even if you can't make yeast bread, make a little biscuit that uh, you can, you know, just just put some uh, things together, oil, flour, water, uh, maybe even an egg, and try to bake it in your little toaster oven. At least it's a bread, and it's got only natural ingredients in it. And uh, I think that if you just did that, if, if you just ate your homemade bread, uh, even though you might consider it a little bit uh, heavy on the uh, gluten, you would still be healthier than the stuff that you eat from the store. And even the non-gluten bread is terrible. You might as well eat paper. Um, so, bread bakers in both Regency era and today have never needed more than four basic ingredients, flour, yeast, water, salt, to create a delicious loaf. Adding much more than that, seeing 15 or 20 or 30 ingredients on a bread label, and you're likely heading into bad bread territory, no matter what the century. Real, honest, old-fashioned bread. Now, I just have to interject something here. Every now and then, as a full-time uh, homemaker, mother, homeschooler, or a lady at home, where your career is taking care of your house and, and the people there, or even if you live by yourself, someone is going to try to intimidate you because you don't have a proper, you, you, you didn't, quote, do anything in the world. You don't have a proper career, and, and uh, you never really did anything. I don't know where they got that phrase from, but every now and then you will find someone will intimidate you, and you might tell me, well, Mrs. Sherman, nobody ever says that to me. That's nice that they don't. But there are people that target uh, people who are happy, at home, women who are happy at home and uh, who have a sense of well-being and are content and they take care of their home and they look at them as look down on them as though they haven't quote done anything. And so what you can do is get really good at making your own bread. And then you can do what this lady from New Zealand told me. She said, uh, it was back in the 1970s and she came to see me. She was a friend of my parents and she came to see me and uh, she said that when someone, in, it was back in the 70s, I think this started, because she mentioned it, that she someone tried to intimidate her and uh, say that she hadn't done anything. And she uh, said, and she was probably in her 50s at the time, she said, I just say to them, well, do you bake bread? <laughs> And she said, all these people bragging about all the things they do and all the careers they have. And I always just look at them. And she got criticism from both men and women. And she'd say, uh, they'd be bragging about everything they had ever done. All their uh, accomplishments, their educational accomplishments, and their commercial accomplishments, and their career accomplishments. And she'd say, yes, dear, but can you bake bread? <laughs> because to her, she said, that means more to me than anything is that if you can you provide sustenance for someone with something besides uh, your money and your achievements. So I always remembered her.
Despite never uttering the phrase gluten-sensitive in her life, much of the bread Austin ate was remarkably gluten-friendly. Before the availability of fast-acting yeast, Regency bakers routinely leavened their breads by mix mixing old chunks of unbaked dough into the new. That's like the sourdough starter that my mother had on the homestead. And I honestly think that the gluten problem came just from eating commercial bread. I don't think it, because we never heard of it. And I, I lived in a time when almost everybody made their own bread. Uh, we didn't have all these maladies, this, these gluten problems. Um, so I think that the gluten uh, reaction came from the fake gluten that was put into the commercial bread. So I think you can still, you can still have bread. You can still have flour if you have really good, uh, good organic things. So that's that's the starter. Now in that book that I told you about called uh, Common Core. Um, I don't know if it was called Common Core or something, and it was this little craft book that I got from England. Uh, I got it on online, and it had uh, something to do for every season. They had in she had in there uh, a recipe for making, for checking out uh, your your dough, your sourdough that you would make uh, naturally, and to you when you took the lid off of it to add your more water and flour, she would say, if there's colored pieces in it that look like this or that, then, then it's no good. You have to throw it out. So if you wanted to learn how to do that, you could probably find many ways to make your own your own dough. Uh, so you take chunks of it and add it to your flour and create the next loaf. I'm still using Red Star yeast. Uh, and, and we're happy with that, and we're not having any problem with it. And I'm using... Uh, so much less than what they say in the recipes uh, because I've learned so much more about uh, leavening. Um, one of the reasons they want you to use so much in the recipes of your yeast is uh, you'll use more and then you'll go buy more uh, and it also raise the bread really fast. But if you're patient and uh, you're content, you can make a good loaf of bread. Now I read to you out of a book I had uh, about breads of the world and it was all about breads and a long, long time ago on a video. Once in, the leftover dough full of yesterday's yeast would naturally start rising the new batch, creating the same soft, airy, springy loaves we still love today, with a slight tang from the wild yeast and friendly bacteria. Now, the sourdough bread you get from the grocery store and the bakeries is actually quite fake compared to, it'll have a tang to it, and you'll think, oh, it's sourdough bread. Uh, it might be harming you with all the extra ingredients and the fake ingredients. With a slight tang from the wild yeast and friendly bacteria. While the process required far more time and patience, anywhere between 12 to 16 hours, well, you wouldn't be standing there 12 to 16 hours, but that's just the, the time span from from doing this to doing that. In between, you'd be um, doing other things. You're not gonna stand there for 16 hours, but that the process would take that long. Uh, you'd be letting it sit there while you did tended to other things in your life. Um, I mean, you can go to the grocery store and then come back and then do something to it, and then you can go hang your laundry out and come back and do something to it, but that's, that's what he meant. 12 to 16 hours to create fully leavened loaf. It also came with simultaneous health benefits. Wheat bread made in this traditional manner, known as sourdough to us, is much easier to digest. Sourdough's long fermentation breaks down the natural gluten in the wheat, creating loaves with dramatically lower amounts of that tricky protein. So much so, a 2007 study found that breads made with this sourdough technique had re such reduced gluten levels they were well under the FDA's legal guidelines for gluten-free foods. It certainly explains, oh, like, who trusts the FDA anymore? <laughs> but still, that's a good point. <laughs> it certainly explains why Austin believed that well-made bread was so easy on the stomach. Ladies, do you know what you're doing at home? This wonderful service you're providing and uh, well-being you're giving people by baking bread. And always remember that lady from New Zealand. She said, that's really nice, dear, but can you bake bread? <laughs> 
It certainly explains why Austin believed that well-made bread was easy on the stomach, with her mother suffering from queasiness and a wobbly stomach after a long journey in 1798. Austin happily reported that, nevertheless, my mother ate some bread several times. So, now he's got a little, uh, little box here I'm going to read, and it's called Jane's Grocery List. I'm thinking... Jane. There were several Janes, weren't there? I mean, depending on which novel you were reading. We walked about snugly together and shopped. Choose thin sliced option for all bread. Leave the rest big rustic thick cut loaves for those Regency peasants and their vulgar relations. <laughs> Watch out for bad bread with dubious chemical additives. Take special care to avoid bread with words such as gluten or vital gluten, bromated, BHA, on its ingredient label. There was another ingredient that I covered oh, a couple of years ago on here that, that I can't remember what it was now, but after that I didn't have to remember it because I just chucked the whole idea of even buying even buying uh, commercial bread. Um, by traditionally made buy traditionally made sourdough whenever possible. Ask your bakery if the dough was made using a natural starter with a long fermentation. Then apologize for being impertinently curious because they don't know. <laughs> they know nothing about it. Bath buns. Now, this is on page 57 and it looks like a, um, a recipe. So you might want to buy the book just for the recipes. But you know, you can't just follow a recipe. You have to know the technique. So go online and watch some videos about the technique of baking, making your own sourdough or baking just ordinary bread using uh, a teaspoon of the, ye the, the yeast. Uh, bath buns makes 12. This was an excellent journey. We ate three of the buns in the course of that stage. The remaining three made an elegant entertainment for Mr. and Mrs. Tilson, who drank tea with us. This is in Austin's letters. I am going to try to get a copy of that. Um, apparently somebody has published a book, uh, The Letters of Jane Austen. Served warm at breakfast or tea, these buns were a favorite treat of Jane's when staying in Bath. One of the most iconic English buns, they're squishy soft with subtle sweetness from the raisins and milky glaze. So here's the dough. A packet of active dry yeast, I use Red Star. But honestly, I don't see that you have to use uh, as much as they say as far as yeast. Uh, yeast, if you've got good flour, you don't need a lot of uh, yeast. Two teaspoons plus two tablespoons sugar divided now you can use any kind of sugar you want. You can have the uh, the uh, organic um, what do you call it sugar that's that's the whole the whole grain that's unbleached and um, turbano sugar I guess it's called. Or you could use something else that you like better. A fourth cup warm water, a half cup milk. Now I've had I've read uh, I've read cooking magazines that come that say don't add the milk for some reason. Uh, and I may have read that to you. Three tablespoons unsalted butter divided. Now the reason they use unsalted butter so that you can use the kind of salt you want uh, instead of the salt that's in the salted butter it apparently makes a difference. Two cups bread flour, not all purpose, no cheating. So I use um, the, the King Arthur flour. I believe that's from from the south, right? They always do things better in the south, don't you agree? Zest of one lemon, half teaspoon salt, an egg beaten, a third cup raisins, and parchment paper. And the glaze <clears throat> is two tablespoons milk, two tablespoons sugar, and anything you want to use for decorating. Put the yeast and two teaspoons of sugar in a small bowl. Pour in the warm water and leave until the yeast is bubbly and frothy about five to ten minutes. Heat the milk and two tablespoons of butter until butter has just melted and allowed to cool slightly. Mix the flour, lemon zest, salt, and two tablespoons of sugar in a large bowl. Make a well in the center of the flour and pour in the warm, not hot, milk and melted butter. If it's too hot, if the liquids are too hot, they will kill the yeast. If the liquids are too cold, uh, the yeast won't grow at all. So this has to be lukewarm. So. And melted butter, the 
yeasty liquid and the beaten egg. Mix with a wooden spoon until just combined. Apparently, uh, a metal spoon affects the quality. Dough will be thick and sticky. Cover the bowl with a damp dishcloth and leave in a warm place for the dough to rise and triple in size about one and a half hours. Well, one of the household hints that I got recently was if you have a dishwasher and uh, you're making bread, while that dishwasher is going, you can put the pan that the dough is in that you want to rise or maybe the the loaves that you've already formed and have risen up. You put it on the surface, on just above where that dishwasher is going, and that gives you plenty of heat, especially if your house is cold that day. So there is a double use then. You don't have to find a, a different way to, you don't have to waste any electricity at all. If you already use your, uh, your dishwasher, just put it on top of the cabinet where the dishwasher is. So then he gives his hint. If your house is cold, try this slightly zany but fail-proof technique. Run your, run your empty clothes dryer for one minute, place the bowl of dough inside, shut the door, and giggle at the cleverness of you. <laughs> well, that wouldn't cost very much, would it? I hadn't really thought of that. That's a good one. Meanwhile, generously dust, uh, one of the things I used to do if, if it was cold, was turn the oven on to uh, 100 and just the, just the lowest one that it will go uh, until it beeped that it had reached that level and then turn it off because it only took a couple minutes it's not going to cost me that much and then stick the dough in there and close the oven uh, to use up the the leftover heat Meanwhile, generously dust a small work surface with flour and get a small handful of raisins at the ready. Line a baking dish with parchment paper. Dust your hands with flour and dump the dough into the floured surface. Shape the dough into short log. Cut the log into four equal pieces, then cut each piece into three smaller pieces to make 12 pieces of dough in total. Now, uh, you can get this and read the rest of it. Uh, these are they're making buns here so you can get the rest of this you can also look up uh, bath buns online watch a video on it and read the rest of it so this is the end of Jane Austen eats bread so and I've read to you several of the other chapters the Pemberley meal plan I've already read that to you and um, so I'll be looking up some other chapters in here that I haven't read read to you so, ladies, I just will maybe read uh, one more thing here, and it's from uh, the McGuffey's third reader, which doesn't mean third grade. It just means it's it's third advanced, and it's pretty advanced as you can tell. Um, and we have been reading um, several things in here. As you know, I've got dried leaves. Uh, dried leaves and I had read to you about the importance of a well-spent youth now I hope it doesn't just make you feel bad because you know just start over just be a just be a youth again and just decide to to learn the principles that you need to have a well-spent youth and uh, so I don't know where I left off here because I didn't mark it but uh, it mentions this the youth and how uh, how important it is to cultivate good things in your heart and your mind when you're young but it doesn't matter when you start this um, it says as the spring is the most important part of the year so youth is the most important period of life well we we mustn't elevate it to uh, such importance that the rest of us can't start over too and have a well-spent youth you know we all need to have a a feeling that we are able to to uh, reconsider and start over and um, reboost our our energy and our enthusiasm for life and so it says here though before we are encumbered by cares distressed by afflictions or engaged in business it becomes necessary to resign our souls to God we used to quote a scripture and it was uh, learned to um, be happy in your youth before the hard times come and this is so true because 
when you're young, if you're listening to me, uh, some of you boys and girls at home, if you're listening to me, when you're young, your parents are taking care of the rent or the, the the taxes on their house. They're taking care of providing for you the food and the clothes. You don't have to worry about anything. You can go to bed at night and not worry uh, that your life is um, under any kind of threat. Uh, the parents do all that for you. Uh, they fill the car with gas and they make sure that uh, that uh, the heat is on and they take take you on vacations and stuff. You don't have to worry about anything. And so you need to um, enjoy that because there will be hard times come when you're going to have to make all those decisions. And uh, so enjoy your, enjoy your youth under your parents' tutelage and at home. Enjoy everything you can at home with their guidance. And, uh, and be sure to love them and respect them and thank them. So ladies, I hope that this has done you, done you good today and that you've got a lot done. This was the purpose of Homemakers Radio was to have something to listen to while you did things. Maybe you went for your walk or maybe you uh, just were sitting still kind of recovering from something or other or maybe you really need to get into something and do it but you just needed a little bit of a boost so i hope that this helped and i will uh, see you next time bye